So I'm, first of all, very grateful for Todd. I have, I think it might have been 2007 was my first year uh, presenting at what was then called uh, POSCON and has since become all things open. Todd has been very gracious in the past of asking for my, uh, my opinion on things as to what he should do to make this event even better. And um, fortunately, he has not heeded any of my suggestions, which is why All Things Open is as fantastic as it is today. And he's just done a, an amazing job. I wanna talk a little bit and uh, appreciate Todd and the other speakers that we've had so far. I wanna talk a little bit about open source in the cloud, which has been a contentious issue in the, in the past. Um, but in the spirit of the people who have already spoken, I don't wanna talk about it from a contentious angle. I wanna talk about it in the spirit of partnership. But I'm gonna start with something that might sound a little contentious. And that is in a conversation that I had not too long ago with a, a colleague of mine, Matt Wilson, he made the observation that most enterprise software is garbage. Um, he might not have used the word garbage, but he said, we talked about why enterprise software is so incredibly bad. And his suggestion was that the reason for that ultimately comes down to the fact that the vendors of the software are not the ultimate users of the software. And the closer we could get, and this goes back to something that uh, now IBM president, then uh, Red Hat CEO, Jim Whitehurst said back in 2009, which was, we have so much waste in, in the software industry. We really need end users. There's not a great word for that, but let's say end users or customers, um, also not a great way of expressing it, but end users of software, we need more end users of software contributing to open source so that instead of reinventing the wheel, we can collaborate. So that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about how we get there and how we bring down the wall between um, open source and cloud. Because there's been this myth that surfaced over the last few years. And that is that in some way, cloud and open source are in contention, are in conflict. And I would argue the opposite is true. Uh, recently in a new stack series that, that I wrote uh, and I, got so much great feedback from people on Twitter and, uh, and quote unquote, in real life um, that said the cloud would not be possible without open source. And I think that's true. I think it might've been Erica who started this uh, day off who said it really, I mean, it, it, part of it comes down to economics, but it's not really a matter of economics. It's really a matter of how, how would you count up all the licenses if you're thinking of thousands or tens of thousands or millions of servers. How do you do that? With open source, you don't really have to think about that. With traditional enterprise software, proprietary software, you did. And it makes it such that the cloud would be, if not impossible, and I would argue impossible, at least extraordinarily difficult. And Chris Debona, who I think is speaking tomorrow, made that contention years ago that Google would not be possible without open source. So. We know that the cloud enables, or that open source enables the cloud, but I wanna talk a little bit about how the cloud is enabling open source. So, and, and as part of that, a good friend of mine, Sam Ramji, who's now chief strategy officer at Datastax, used to be the open source guy back when that was a thing at Microsoft, but that was a long time ago. Now open source is uh, everybody's thing at, at Microsoft. Um, Sam likes to say, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. It's not his saying, but he says it a lot. So I want to talk about that. And I'm also going to talk about Pi, in part because at that first POSCON, All Things Open, that I spoke at, Todd, uh, Todd fed us all because that Todd's like that. It's that Southern hospitality, um, but also because I like to bake pie. So we're going to talk a little bit about Pi. When you think of the biggest contributors to open source, I'd be interested, and we can't take a, a poll here and ask everybody, but I'd be interested who you think of when you, when you think of that. When I say the biggest contributor that you can think of to open source, put it, keep it in your mind. I'm pretty sure you're thinking of a cloud vendor right now. And if you are, you 
if you're playing your odds of the top 10 uh, open source contributors, seven of those top 10 are cloud vendors. And I use the term cloud um, a little bit loosely. I shouldn't say vendors, I should say cloud companies because in that number is Facebook, for example. In that, in that group is Amazon. In that group is Google, Microsoft, Red Hat slash IBM, um, but also other companies. There are a few other companies that don't fit that cloud label like um, Intel, for example, but Intel does a fair amount to enable the cloud with, with chips and other so in software. But think about that. Why would that be that the vast majority, if you, if you tally up the biggest contributors in terms of raw contributors, um, to open source, why would they be cloud companies? And I think it's, I think it, if you, if you step back for, for a second, it's a little bit obvious why that would be the case. It's because cloud companies don't really have anything to lose by contributing software. They don't sell software. Facebook doesn't sell software. AWS or Amazon doesn't sell software, they sell services. So the software itself can be given away. And if we look again at the, at the things that have come out of the different cloud companies, amazing software like Kubernetes that came out of Google. Um, th this is the sort of thing that the cloud enables because it takes away the competitive uh, need to keep software proprietary. So if you, if you run um, some sort of calculus as to contributes equals to benefits, well, it also makes sense that the cloud companies would be big contributors uh, because we're benefiting a great deal from open source. And I wanna talk about that. But really, I wanna get away a bit from talking about the big companies behind open source. And I wanna talk about the people behind open source and how people are making software open source software better in the cloud. And the first person I wanna to talk to about is Dries Beitert, a, a friend of mine who uh, much more importantly, well, much more importantly to you um, as to why he's important, he's the founder of Drupal. But that's not how Dries started. When he started Drupal, he didn't start Drupal. He was looking for a way to share a, a quote unquote high speed ADSL internet connection as a student in Belgium. And he and his friends were just looking for to build a bulletin board. Well, that little bulletin board evolved into Drupal, which last year, or for the last major release had 10,000 different contributors to the project. It's an amazing example of open source success. But getting from Dries and his friends to Dries and 10,000 of his friends and by the way, Dries, so he started a company called Acquia and Acquia, despite being the largest single contributor to, to Drupal, accounted for less than 5% of those total contributions to the last release. So how did he get from one person to 10,000? Well, along the way in 2000, um, Dries, in a conversation that I had with him, he said in 2000, it was a, they were really struggling to scale Drupal. And part of that was MySQL. MySQL is a great open source database, but he was struggling with all the, as he said, the hundreds of knobs that he had to fiddle with to get it to scale. Circa 2006, AWS launches, and suddenly that he's, in his words, that became dramatically easier. And he says, you have no idea the change that it made for Drupal in enabling them to scale it. So on the one hand, thinking about cloud, one thing that cloud does is that it makes it so that individual open source entrepreneurs, and an entrepreneur, I don't mean that they necessarily start a business, I just mean that they start a project. An open source entrepreneur finds it dramatically easier to start and scale their project. It's one thing that the cloud does. Another example, a more recent example, is Matt Klein with Envoy. Envoy is this fantastic open source project that Matt started as, um, as an engineer at Lyft. In Matt's words, when he, when he uh, started the Envoy, it started off just as an, an, an internal project. They were trying to move from 
a monolithic, uh, a monolith based architecture to a microservices based architecture. And so uh, they, he and, and his team created Envoy. Great. But then they decided, well, maybe we should open source this. And in Matt's words, he did this in part because he thought it'd be good for his career. Lyft did it in part because they thought it'd be great for recruiting. But it was an example of an, of an individual uh, person, uh, Matt, deciding that he wanted to open source this thing and then taking it out. Now, it's become this great service mesh that uh, a lot of different people use, but it started as him scratching an itch for Lyft. And, it, and thinking about it in terms of we're seeing, again, coming back to that idea of the best software will emerge from those who use the software. In Dries's case, it was Dries starting it to, to share um, internet access at, at a university in Belgium. In Matt's case, it was him sharing the software that would enable um, Lyft to get a higher return on their investment and in Envoy uh, but they built it to, to support cloud native applications at, at uh, Lyft. Um, incidentally, I asked Matt recently, why don't we see more user-driven open source and user-driven open source? And I, I try not to swear, so I won't quote him verbatim, but he said, it's because it's so effing hard. Um, and he said, but for my naivete, I never would have done this. But we're grateful that he did. And now today, he's we have this great open source project. And by the way, um, if you look at the contributors to it, at least 40%, roughly 40% of that code to, contributed to Envoy is coming from Google. And so we see the cloud contributing back to, uh, to what it's created. I'm gonna go to one more example. And this is uh, Madeline Olson. And it's the story of Redis, but that story starts not with Madeline, it starts with Salvatore Sanfilippo, who was the founder of, of Redis. And when Salvatore started uh, Redis, he did it, it, this also has another MySQL angle. He did it not because um, he really wanted to start to uh, build a new database. He had no experience with database. He says, I had no idea what I was getting into. I broke all the rules on, on database design. Uh, no one really would take an in-memory database seriously at the time, but he did it anyway, and he started it. One thing that it didn't have was encryption built in. So Madeline is an engineer on the Elasticash team at, at AWS, and I think roughly two years ago, she and her manager decided, hey, you know what? We depend in significant part on Redis. We should contribute back. Well, you don't just walk into Mordor and you don't just walk into an open source project and take over as take over that project. So Madeline started small and in her words, she continued to be a relatively small contributor. She did things like enable greater communication by starting a Slack channel um, for Redis contributors. She did other things like um, preparing other people's contributions to make it, help them pass muster with Salvatore. And she did one thing that she didn't get actually her code uh, accepted by Salvatore, but she came up with the idea of how to get encryption built into Redis. And uh, Yossi Gottlieb, one of the contributors and Salvatore reviewed it, said, decided that they didn't want to take that, her code, but liked the approach. And so they used that approach and built their own code, but it was little contributions like that, that earned her goodwill with the team. And then recently when Redis decided, or the, the Redis uh, Salvatore decided to leave Redis to go pursue other things, they came up with a new governance structure and Madeline was asked to be one of the five maintainers along with uh, three folks from Redis Labs and Zhao Zhao from Alibaba. It's a great story of how an individual working at a cloud company because it was solving a a particular cloud companies are scratching our itch, how she went from a small contributor to now a significant maintainer. But I think it also says a great deal about how open source can work in the cloud. So here you start with Salvatore, who by the way, I wish I looked like Salvatore, these rugged good looks, kind of looks like uh, Michael Hutchins, um, the uh, former uh, lead vocalist for NXS, Salvatore, if you're listening, 
man crush on you. The but you look at what it went from Salvatore to Redis Labs starting um, to help fund the development of of Redis to where we are today with Redis Labs continuing to to fund a significant amount of the development around Redis, but also a number of cloud vendors building managed Redis services around Redis. It's a fantastic example. And you say, well, surely this has cratered Redis Labs revenue. I don't, I'm not privy to their, to their numbers and I wouldn't divulge them if I were, but in my conversations with them and they're a great partner of, of AWS, they're doing really, really well. It turns out that sharing code and sharing and growing a pie is a good strategy. So let's talk about pie, because like I said, I really like pie and bake a lot of pie. And let's do some pie related math. So Gardner said that in um, 2020, even with COVID, global IT spending should top about $3.9 trillion, a lot of money. Cloud, and we spend a lot of time talking about cloud and like figuring out who's winning in the cloud wars. Well, it's a relatively small, piece of that overall pie, 266 billion. It's, it's significant money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a really small pie. I was an English major and so I'm not necessarily great at math, but I think what that means is that when we spend time agonizing and fighting over who's winning in the cloud and who's uh, is cloud chewing into open source, et cetera. We're talking, we're fighting over 6% of that global IT spend, which is a little ridiculous. Now we could say that, well, you know, we've been conditioned to think about um, in this way of we're conditioned to think about small pie. Martin Mikos is a good friend. And about 15 years ago, when he was CEO of MySQL, he's now CEO of HackerOne. But when he was CEO of, of MySQL and he came up with this great quote saying for in open source, he wanted to take a big market, make it smaller and then take a big chunk of that market. And we're kind of used to thinking about um, when we talk about open source that like saving money and we're, we talk about cloud, we talk about it in the same way. And so we end up with this little small pie. It's a cute pie. That's my, um, strawberries and cream pie that I like to make, but it's a small pie and I like pie. So I don't really want small pie. So I had this conversation with Simon Wardley. Many of you have uh, know Simon and, and I think he's, uh, I'm sure he's spoken here before. In fact, I think I've heard him speak at All Things Open before. He introduced me to this idea of Jevons paradox. And in a nutshell, that idea is we normally think that when we save money, when unit costs go down, that the overall pie is going to shrink, that the market will shrink because people will spend less money because they'll pocket those savings and move on. Turns out that's not how things work in real life. When we save money on, um, on our cloud spend because of our cloud spend, we, spend, we end up spending more. When we save more by moving to Postgres, um, we end up spending more on databases or on, or, or on other services around it. So the way that I read that is that instead of, instead of the lower unit costs that cloud and open source together bring us, instead of that turning into less pie, it turns into more. The pie isn't shrinking, it's getting bigger. And by the way, that applies to to the open source companies. I saw just last week that uh, uh, Databricks, they, I think, I think they actually announced this, that they are now on a $350 million run rate selling managed uh, Spark and, and other open source software. Well, guess what? Databricks has healthy competition from, from my company and, for, and from others. And they're doing great in part because a variety of contributors are growing that pie. Look at MongoDB doing phenomenally well. I think roughly 500 million in revenue now, almost half of which getting close to half of which comes from their cloud service Atlas, which is fantastic. 
and you go down the list, Confluent uh, recently, well, last year, raised money on a huge valuation, doing really, really well in terms of revenue. Um, Elastic, the same thing, Redis Labs, Data Stacks, HashiCorp, all these open source companies doing really well. And I would argue they're doing really well precisely because they've embraced cloud. And early on, we had some friction because uh, uh, over licensing gymnastics, but I think that was just a moment in time. I think it was just, it, it gave us time until we got to the point where we realized the cloud is not competitive to open source. It's an enabler for open source. It makes it so that end users can focus more time on getting work done rather than on doing the undifferentiated heavy lifting of setting up and, and managing infrastructure. It's a really good thing what we have now. I wanna end with um, somebody who I think is extraordinarily smart, Adam Jacob. He was the co-founder and CTO at Chef and, uh, and now the co-founder of System Initiative. And he talks about cloud and open source in this way. He says, you can think of it as competitive or you can think of it as a way of growing that overall, um, the top of funnel, or again, in my words, uh, growing the pie. And I remember having this conversation with a friend um, that I had worked with when I was at MongoDB. And uh, we were at reInvent, AWS reInvent, back when we were able to go and talk to people in person. And it just struck me at that time that we, those two companies, but in general, we were wasting a lot of time fighting over relatively small pieces of pie and that it would be much better for each of us to go out and build that pie, contribute to that upstream um, open source project. And we've seen that at my company, we've seen that with um, most recently with Redis, but also GraphQL and, and a number of other projects. And if you look across those cloud companies, people are doing, I think, a, a pretty good job of doing that. We've, we've had to figure it out over time, but my sense is that there's this great opportunity for all of us to build these open source pies, open source communities together. We need to be a little bit patient with each other. There's, it's easy to make, make accusations and assume that we know what other people are thinking. We assume we know why they do the things that, that, that they do whether on an individual level or on a um, macro level, on a company level, I just ask that we be a little bit more thoughtful of each other and that we remember open source is ultimately about community. It's ultimately about people. It's ultimately about enabling those people. And as we do that, we do something that makes me really happy. And that is we grow the open source pie. Thank you very much. And Todd, again, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.